The NFL Draft is a notorious crapshoot of talent. It's come a long way since the old days. Back in 1936, the first pick ever in the NFL Draft declined to play. In fact, only 24 of the 81 players selected chose to play in the NFL. Over time, that narrative would change. But even with the improvement in technology, even when you can select one of the top 10 college football players from the previous season, this didn't guarantee that you were going to get a great player. The 2006 NFL Draft had one of the most exciting big boards in recent memory. I remember being a kid and this was the first draft that I wanted to watch. In this video, we will go over each of the top 10 picks and what ended up happening to them as time went on. With that being said, let me give a shout out to my sponsor SeatGeek. There is no better place to get tickets for cheap and SeatGeek gathers tickets from all across the web into one area, making buying so easy. They rate these tickets on a scale of 1 to 100, with the higher the number, the better the deal. If you still haven't done it yet, use my promo code KTO at checkout for $20 off your next purchase. So now, let's dive into this video. With the 10th pick in the draft, the Arizona Cardinals selected Matt Leinart. The Cardinals hadn't drafted a quarterback this high in 19 years, and the front office decided that it was time. They felt confident going with one of the most decorated college quarterbacks ever. Standing at 6'5", Leinart possessed the size of an NFL quarterback, but questions did remain about his relatively weak arm. Things started off pretty rocky. Leinart ended up holding out at training camp looking for a massive contract. By the time he came around to finally signing it, he was the last of the first round picks to do so. And this decision to wait pissed off head coach Dennis Green. During his rookie season, he set a franchise record for passing yards in a game versus the Vikings. But he did throw two picks. They lost the game, and things never looked much better than that. With a contentious relationship with his new head coach Ken Wisenhunt and poor performance on the field led to Leinart being benched and out of Arizona by 2009. After a brief stint with the Texans, Raiders, and Bills, Leinart played in only four games after 2009 and he was out of the league entirely by 2013. Currently, he is now working as a college football analyst. With the ninth pick in the draft, the Lions selected Ernie Sims. Coming out of high school as a four-time state champion, Ernie Sims was ranked as the number one recruit in the country in 2003. The hype coming into Florida State was big time. It was such a huge deal that former player Ron Sellers, whose jersey was retired, had unretired his jersey for Sims to wear. Although he did play well for the Seminoles, he did have some baggage. In 2005, Sims was arrested for allegedly throwing his girlfriend on the ground in one of the school's hallways. This is an offense that I think would have been taken much more serious by the NFL teams today, and he probably wouldn't have been picked in the top 10. Another curious thing about Sims was he didn't even know anything about the Lions when he was drafted. When you got the call and it was Detroit, what thoughts went through your mind? Um, like I said, um, the excitement. I, I, I really, I really didn't know nothing about any teams in the NFL. I mean, the only closest thing, the closest team that I knew was was Tampa Bay because they're, they're in the state of Florida. But um, I didn't know the history about Detroit Lions. The only thing I knew was really Barry Sanders. He played there. For the next few years, he was a decent player for the Lions, but after progressively getting worse, he was eventually traded to the Eagles in a three-team trade. He would jump around a bit after that, mostly as a role-playing backup. Then in 2014, after the Cardinals had picked up Ernie Sims on a one-year deal, he was released for the final time before the season began. He's now currently an assistant strength and conditioning coach for the Florida Atlantic football team. With the eighth pick in the draft, the Buffalo Bills selected Dante Whitner. Here's the thing about this pick. Whitner was a great player, just not for the Bills. He started every game for four years, yet he didn't really stand out, at least according to the Buffalo sports writers. In 2011, after his rookie contract ended, Whitner announced on Twitter that he was going to sign with the Bengals, which never happened. He ended up signing with the 49ers on a three-year deal, and this is where everything changed. The Niners got really good. During their run throughout the 2011 playoffs, Dante Whitner became known as Dante Hittner. <laughs> that 
that hit, as you might expect, knocked that dude out of the game. Whitner also announced that he was going to change his name legally to Hitner. This never materialized. After a brief two-year stint with the Browns, where he actually played pretty well, and one year with the Redskins, Whitner called it a career in 2016. He retired a three-time Pro Bowler, and you can still find him now on Instagram or Twitter, working out harder than ever. With the seventh pick in the draft, the Oakland Raiders selected Michael Huff. The Raiders were in the tail end of the Al Davis era. One of the most memorable ideologies surrounding the way that he drafted was speed, speed, and more speed. This pick was no exception. Michael Huff was a safety out of Texas. He came into school as a track guy, then eventually developed into a talented star on the defensive side of the ball. Actually, during the national championship, he was one of the key defenders on a crucial stop late in the game versus USC. He's the power back. He gets it. He didn't get it. Half the stadium's gonna go crazy. The burn orange side did. After dropping a 4.34 at his pro day, Al Davis couldn't resist. He put together seven pretty good years with the Raiders, with his prime season in 2010, where he was selected second team all pro. After getting cut in 2013, he would last one more season in the league before officially retiring from professional football. Currently, he is now a part of the Texas football coaching staff. With the sixth pick in the draft, the San Francisco 49ers selected Vernon Davis. The 49ers decided to go with the athletic receiving tight end out of Maryland. This dude ran a 4.38, which is insane. His broad jump was also a foot further than the next best tight end. This was probably his best moment in the NFL. By San Francisco, and Davis is rejected by the crossbar. Following this, he decided to take up professional curling instead. Right, baby. I'm just kidding. He actually was legit at football. Probably the best player that we have gone over up to this point. By 2009, he was one of the top tight ends in the NFL, tied for the league leading amount of receiving touchdowns. And during the 2011-2012 playoffs, he made his most iconic play. Into the middle, get the timeout called, have a new set of downs with the first down, and maybe take a shot into the end zone before you wanted to line up and take this field goal attempt. Smith on third and three. He throws to the end zone, and the catch is made by Vernon Davis for a Niners touchdown. After a storied career with the 49ers, he was traded to Denver, where he went on to become a Super Bowl champion. Currently, he's a member of the Washington Redskins, reunited with his old pal, Alex Smith. With the uh, fifth choice in the 2006 NFL Draft, the Green Bay Packers select A.J. Hawk, linebacker, Ohio State. A.J. Hawk was considered the best linebacker in the draft, and here's a pretty interesting piece of trivia. In A.J. Hawk's final college game versus Notre Dame, he went head-to-head -head with Brady Quinn. Hawk happens to be married to Brady Quinn's sister. He sacked him twice, and the Buckeyes dominated that game. A.J. Hawk has just sacked his future brother-in-law. <laughs> When Hawk came to Green Bay, he was an instant difference maker. And with the rise of guys like Aaron Rodgers and Clay Matthews, this Packers team would go on to win a Super Bowl, where A.J. Hawk played very well. A.J. Hawk, for nine years, was a reliable cornerstone of the Packers' defense. He led the team in tackles in five of those seasons. After time with the Packers and Bengals, Hawk announced his retirement from the NFL in early 2017. He now spends his time doing his own podcast, also a co-host of the Laces Out podcast with Pat McAfee. With the uh, fourth choice in the 2006 NFL Draft, the New York Jets select DeBrickashaw Ferguson, offensive tackle, University of Virginia. Now, you gotta admit, it doesn't get much better than the name DeBrickashaw. I'm pretty sure the rowdy Jets fans in the draft were happy on that note alone. His name was the inspiration for Key and Pill's famous East-West College Bowl video. And besides his name, he was very good during his time with the Jets. As a black belt in karate and a brown belt in taekwondo, his natural athleticism helped pave the way to 160 straight starts for the Jets. He never missed a game, and he went on to three Pro Bowls. He officially decided to call it quits in 2016. Much like the legend of Joe Thomas's snap streak, DeBrickashaw only missed one offensive snap in 10 years. With 
The uh, third choice in the 2006 NFL Draft, the Tennessee Titans select Vince Young, quarterback, University of Texas. The man who took down the monster that was USC football. Vince Young etched out a legacy in college football that has reached lower status. He bears college football's most iconic moment. The big question that remained was, can he be a successful NFL quarterback? From what he showed, in five seasons with the Titans, there were flashes that make you say, yes, he can. Whether it was putting together a 99-yard walk-off, or a fourth quarter comeback versus the Giants or the Colts. After winning Rookie of the Year, becoming the Madden cover athlete, and making two Pro Bowls, you would say, wow, the potential was definitely there. He always possessed the clutch gene, but in the end, things didn't work out. With publicized incidents of Vince Young getting into altercations with Jeff Fisher, the quarterback found himself out of Tennessee after his rookie contract was up. And after one disappointing season in Philly, Vince found himself multiple times signing and being released shortly after. He gave the CFL a shot, which didn't go all that well. He would tear his hamstring and be waived within the first year he was signed. Did Jeff Fisher ruin his chance to be successful? You could make a strong argument for that. Vince has also said publicly that he should have just shut up and worked hard. He had the potential to be what Cam Newton has been, but for how things went. The hero from Texas will forever remain a what if. With the uh, second choice in the 2006 NFL Draft, the New Orleans Saints select Reggie Bush, running back USC. If you thought Saquon Barkley has been highly publicized, well, in the words of Brent Musburger, Hello everybody, meet Mr. Bush. Reggie Bush was a celebrity in college, and possibly the greatest to ever run the ball at the collegiate level. He could run, catch, return kicks, whatever he did, he made the opposing team look like a complete joke. Reebok had over 15,000 orders for his Saints jersey right after the draft, even though he hadn't even chosen his number yet. The amount of endorsement deals that he received were insane, but his football career didn't stand out the way people had hoped. He was not bad by any means. He never made a Pro Bowl, but he did have a couple thousand yard seasons, and he did win a Super Bowl. In the end, Bush was good, not great. With the hype that he received out of college, it's almost impossible to live up to that expectation. You can now see him frequently appearing on different networks as an analyst. With the uh, first selection in the 2006 NFL Draft, the Houston Texans select Mario Williams, defensive end, North Carolina State. Compared to some of these other dudes, Mario Williams was relatively unknown. Out of NC State, Mario had set their all-time mark for sacks in a career. This mark would hold until this past year when it was broken by Bradley Chubb. But as far as everyone else on this list, Mario Williams proved that he deserved to go number one overall. In his second year, he finished with 14 sacks, and he followed that up by going to two straight Pro Bowls. After dealing with a few injuries, his play did slow down and he would eventually be released. He then signed a massive contract with the Bills, and he became one of the cornerstones of their defensive line. He averaged double-digit sacks for the next three seasons. Although he did run himself out of Buffalo with contention between him and Rex Ryan, and one disappointing year with the Dolphins after that, Mario Williams was one of the better defensive linemen in the league for the better half of 10 years. Plus, on top of that, this dude has to be the scariest dude on this list. Just imagine lining up on offense. Looking across the line of scrimmage, you see this dude standing at 6'6", six six, 290 pounds, and looking directly at you with those red eyes. Oh, 